All right, installment number two today. Uh, today is Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019. My name's Randy. Gregory? How you doing? Greg Semmel from Omega Steel. Can't wait to hear your story, Greg. So let's get going on this. So uh, tell me about what year you started in the steel pipe business and what was it Omega Steel? Yes, it was, Randy. We uh, started in 1980, June 18th, which is also my wedding reception, which helps because I remember them both by correlation. And uh, basically we started out as a steel distribution center versus a pipe company. We sold a little pipe, but mostly steel distribution. And then we, uh, within a year and a half, we had transformed back into a pipe company, or transformed to a pipe company. Gotcha. And what do you mean by uh, a distribution versus a steel pipe company? Well, a steel distribution center is somebody who sells angles and channels and uh, expanded metal and plates and things of that nature. So that's how I got my, my breaking into, I guess, into the steel industry. Uh, unfortunately, that business is very competitive and very uh, competitive and doesn't... Um, that doesn't make much room for, for uh, profit margins. So after learning that and losing $130,000 the first three years, we decided this was not the way we should go. So we jumped into the pipe business and I vowed never to get back into the steel distribution business again. Gotcha, and how did, how did Omega Steel come about? I mean, you, somebody just doesn't wake up one day and say, well, I'm gonna be in the steel pipe business, or maybe you do, tell me about it. Um, what, we were at the river, our family had a, a river place, and one of my dad's next door neighbors came up who was working for Tubular Steel at the time as a warehouse manager, and he came in and said, hey, I'd like to open up a steel company, and I had just graduated college, and my dad said, well, I'll finance you, but you have to teach my good-for-nothing son um, something about the steel industry. So that's basically how we got started. Probably within two or three months after that, we were open. The name came from my dad's uh, company, Ford Tool Steel, which he was uh, a steel owner also. And I worked many summers there uh, cutting grass, and then I turned into their production cutter and uh, had my own bay and four saws and things of that nature while I was growing up. But uh, the the transformation from Omega Seal came from his cutting company and we already had it set up as a corporation. So therefore, we had it made up and that was a 1971 uh, corporation that started. So actually we're at lo older than we pretend to be. Well, wow, fantastic, okay. And um, when you started Omega Steel, was it here in St. Louis or you know where, where exactly were you at? Yeah, we were in St. Louis, um, been here all of our lives, uh, grew up, born and raised in good old St. Louis. How many people did you start uh, with at Omega Steel and who were some of those uh, more prominent uh, people with you? There was three of us, uh, Ken Shonoff, Don Hill, Bob Bendix, four, four including myself. I was going to be the accountant. Uh, Bendix was our super salesman who sold a lot of tubular goods. And then Kenny and Don were the ones that knew the steel business. Uh, within a year, the cream kind of rose to the top and uh, we had to let the, the Don Hill go. Uh, within three years, we had to let Kenny Shonoff go. And uh, Bob Bendix was around for about another 10 years, I guess, total. And did Don uh, help uh, build a sales force? Or um, what did those early years at Omega look like? Basically four of us in a room no bigger than this, so probably a 10 by 20 room. Uh, we borrowed coffee from the coffee from the landlord until he got tired of us coming in there 62 times a day. And uh, basically just the four of us getting on a phone trying to sell stuff. Uh, we really didn't have very many, many employees until after the second year when we bought a warehouse so we could distribute better. And uh, at that point, we probably still only had six people, and that probably lasted for five, seven years. 
And were you uh, brokering pipe, or did you have inventory? You know, at the very start, before you got your warehouse and that type of deal. The very beginning, we didn't have inventory. We would not have qualified for the NASPD with 500 tons of material. Um, and I'd say it probably took us a, a period of three to four years to hit the 500 ton quota. Most of it was angles, channels, uh, expanded metal, and then we'd start getting into more and more pipe as we learned that there was more margins in pipe. Gotcha. So uh, in your warehouse in those early days, it was more service center type. Is that Would that be a fair... Yeah, it was all, mainly all local. Uh, we'd take the orders in the morning and in the night we'd go out and fill them and load the truck up or have it ready to be loaded out the next day. So a lot of uh, dual purpose work. Gotcha. When you, when you said that, uh, you know, your, your dad had you, wanted you to learn, you know, the steel business from his friend, um, what were your early memories of, of learning the steel uh, industry? And tell me about some of those. Experiences. Well, the, the one thing that came to mind, I, I just got out of college, and it, it seemed like it was pretty much the same as college. You'd go to class for the first half of the day, then you'd go out and visit a customer, then you wouldn't come back. You'd go out and finish drinking and come back the next day and start over. So that was kind of uh, weird for the first one or two years, and then we realized we had to work a little bit more, so we partied less and worked harder. Um, the weird thing is, you know, you don't have any money. You don't have, uh, you can't float somebody on terms, so you're constantly trying to collect funds from people, and you're living off a shoestring and trying to make payroll. And the first 25 years of business is what I would say were the probably worst 25 years of business. You'd make 100000 you'd lose 100000 The banks were always trying to close you down. And then in 2004, as you know, uh, we became a world economy, and the markets went from $20, $40 worth of scrap up to $240, and everything doubled or tripled, and you started making money like you should have been doing for many years prior, but the prices were too low to, to justify it. Right, right. Was there anything in those early years that, um, a pivotal or defining moment, you know, something that impacted your business positively or negatively? Uh, pretty much just trying, you know, the, the interest rates back in the day, 1980 to 1988, maybe 1990, we were in the 13 to 15 percent interest brackets. And borrowing from a bank at those rates today would almost be impossible to keep your company afloat. So that was the biggest deterrent was how much the interest rates uh, were different than they are today. Cause you know, if, if you're a point under prime right now, it's not that bad. It's four and a half, four percent. Right. So compare that to an 18 percent market, made it very difficult to make money back in the back in the day. Yeah, back in the day, being, yeah. being the 80s. And, yes. Yeah, and the early 90s. Was there, um, back in that time, was there a, uh, you know, a low point, um, something that, you know, was really tough to, you know, keep your business going and keep you going? Well, in 84, we had to let the president go for some reasons. And uh, that meant I was taking over the whole reins of the company and it was very scary, very hard to comprehend that, okay, now it's everything that goes wrong is your fault and trying to keep these people, their paychecks is your fault. And uh, that was very uh, scary. And again, with the banks constantly uh, wanting to close you down because you weren't making enough money, that was always, you're always on the edge for that first 10, 15 years. And it just, it was part of your life. You didn't know any different. And especially coming straight out of college, you didn't have any past history of what it's supposed to be like to be a president or to be a owner of a company. So um, I was definitely underqualified, made a lot of mistakes on managing people because I would manage them as I wanted uh, my dad's company to be. But as I found out over the years, he was probably doing it a lot better than I was because we were a little bit wild and crazy and not following many rules. And you just can't have a company running on the edge and not have the right rules in place to, to keep everybody uh, equal, I guess you'd say. Sure, sure. 
Uh, if uh, if someone was just starting out in the business now, uh, what would you, uh, what would be your advice? What would you tell them would be the secret to success? Are you talking about as, them as an owner or them as an employee in our business? I think just starting out as an employee, what would you, uh, what advice would you give them? Well, the number one thing is learn the product. Know what you're talking about. There's nothing worse than trying to talk to um, a rookie on the phone and not know what a piece of pipe is, what an OD is, a wall is, a grade is. The chemistry of those products are, are imperative to know also. Um, pay attention to your phone adequate. Uh, make sure you, you don't piss somebody off on the phone. But most of all, be yourself. And you know, you've got to have that personality come through the phone. Today, everybody wants to email and text. And that's great, except for one thing. Randy, you and I learned to make phone calls. And when we made phone calls, we made friends. And when we made friends, we had friends that bought from us and we took care of our friends. Nowadays, it's all price, everything's equal, and you don't have that friendship relationship. And trying to explain that to the new, new generations, they just don't get it. And even though you can text and email, you still have to call that guy afterwards and close the deal. If you could try to explain to one of those new guys the the amount of work and the effort that it would take, how could you go about doing that? Well, I'm assuming sales. I mean, uh, accounting's pretty much standard in every industry, right. but sales, it's just perseverance and, and making sure you have a, a set pattern on how to call people, what to ask, make sure you qualify who you're calling. Because what happens, we, we have salesmen that will call 300 people in a week or 400 people in a week, but they're not qualifying them. They're doing quantity or, or quantity over quality. And as one of our better salesmen who's come up over the last five or seven years, he's teaching our sales floor to make sure that those people actually buy what we're trying to sell because we are now limited in an X grade market. We don't want to see used inquiries and we need to educate our customer on what we're going to be good at and we're not good at everything. And then that's one of the things that I think uh, people are always trying to be that quantity person versus the quality and I think that hurts our industry yeah. and the salesman starting out. Right. You're one of the more unique interviews that I've had. And that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and, and, and the reason I say that, Gregory, is um, that you started off, you know, basically as an owner. Um, you know, there was some, um, you know, morphing going on there in the first, you know, two or three to four years to get, you know, right where you, you needed it with the leadership and everything. But if you were to go back in time and meet yourself, at the start of your career with Omega Steel, what advice would you give yourself? Quit being a smart ass and thinking you know everything. Of course, that comes with age also. But in, our, in my case, uh, cocky, uh, arrogant, needs to get toned down and you need to have respect for everybody you deal with. Made a lot of mistakes when I was young. Did not have the respect for people I should have had. and. Uh, I probably would have given myself a pretty good ruling on the, over the fingers a couple of times to let myself know that uh, you're not doing it right. You're not taking your people serious and you're not treating them right, along with customers and, and vendors and whatever. It was always about winning the deal and not basically looking at both sides of the deal. Sure, sure, that's good advice, Greg. Um, the first time I met you was at an NASPD convention. Um, you know, and I want to say going all the way back to possibly 1995 uh, at a Las Vegas convention. And I remember I, in my office, I still have a picture of that. Of the horseshoe. horseshoe. Yeah. And um, tell me, when, do you remember your first NASPD convention? It's probably two meetings before that in San Diego would be my guess. I was not a member very long when you and I first met. Um, in San Diego, again, not knowing what the NASPD was, you know, you'd walk into their meetings and back then they were struggling pretty bad. And there'd be one or two people listening to a speaker and it was ugly, you know, but everybody was more there to just sit around and talk to each other about making the deal. 
And uh, back then we made deals at those conventions. Now, not so much. Now it's more corporate and less uh, deal making, which bothers me because quite honestly, that's what I enjoyed the most about the NASPD was the deal making and just talking to your buddies. This is the most unusual business I think I've ever seen. You and I are competitors, but we're best friends. Now tell me where else in the world that happens. And that's with another 230 other companies. We're best friends with all these people. And, the, you know, we leave the meetings and the next day we're competing head to head for an order. Right. Kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand. Um, what we're uh, thinking back uh, on those conventions, um, who were some of the guys you used to run with? Obviously, we, you know, I know some of those answers, but. Tell, tell everybody else out there, who are the, some of the memorable characters that, uh, that you used to run with? Well, characters was probably a good analogy of who we had. You had Jay, Jay Solansky, who was probably the biggest maverick out of the group. Um, Max Reckenthal, who is not a member anymore, he was Texas Iron. Don Karchmer, uh, John Mocker. Oh God, we could go on and on and on. The guys that have been there the longest were, you know, the ones you became best friends with. Uh, you, of course, um, uh, Bruce Halp. But what was neat is, you know, once we got to know each other, it was like we've known each other all of our lives. It was a very uh, family orientated situation. And, you know, drinking was a major part back then. I don't think so much now as it was. And I think that was also also the kind of the times in the 90s and 80s, uh, there was a lot of drinking going on. Yeah. Now maybe I've gotten older and I don't drink as much, which I'd have to say is probably true, but I just don't see the, the level of drinking and partying like we used to. And that's probably good for the association also. <laughs> what were some of, uh, if you can name off uh, one or two of your you know favorite places that you went uh, with the NASPD, more memorable conventions? I, I really couldn't pull out the two neatest or best ones or whatever. What I will tell you about the NASPD and the places we go to is it's so cool to go to places that you normally wouldn't go to. So who would go to Denver? Who would go to Coeur d'Alene? Who would go to... Um, San Diego that many times. And each time we go, we stay at a different place, so we got to learn a little bit more. But while you go to these meetings, you also get to ex you know, ex explore the cities and you get to go places. We went to Miramar in San Diego one time, uh, did uh, Torrey Pines and got to play golf at Torrey Pines in Fort, uh, not Lauderdale, what was the one above that? Uh, Jacksonville, we got to go to the TPC course and play that. Uh, so everywhere we go, we get to see things that you probably wouldn't do on a regular vacation. You're seeing it with your best friends in the industry and you're just having a great time uh, exploring things and being with your friends. The, the wineries, d d doing the uh, wine tasting back on the buses without permission, I might say. Um, <laughs> You know, Houston, Texas, when you have 560 people at a happy hour because you're in Houston, Texas, and that's where all the pipe companies are, you can never get around to see everybody, but you don't care. <laughs> you're having a great time in Texas. So Yeah. So um, I'm going to circle back to, you know, uh, is there anything else you want to share with me about NASPD before I, I get cleared off of that? Um. It was a, it's a great organization. I think we've made some changes, and now that you're president, we're going to be pushing on you a little bit to get back to the way we used to be a little bit more, in my opinion. Um, you know, you've got a great nucleus of, of leaders that are there that are still involved, the, uh, the Mockers, the Karchmers, the um, Geralds. Um, and those guys just, they live, eat, and drink that organization, and they're never going to let it deteriorate. And uh, it's still one of the best organizations out there. I've been to a lot of association meetings, and we probably have the best one that I've ever been to. Very good. Well, um, when we're, we're kind of getting down to the end of the uh, interview, and one of the... Uh, 
last few things I wanted to ask you was, besides your your career, besides the steel pipe business in your career, what are the things that uh, you might be most proud of? What gives you joy and satisfaction outside of this business? Well, number one would be uh, faith in God, and number two would be your family. Uh, the fact that you can raise family while you're trying to run a business is miraculous, considering all the pressure we're under every day to do this and do that. Spending time with them, making sure you go to every event that you can, being out of town a lot of times and you can't. Uh, back then, we didn't have FaceTime. We had a call on a phone from a payphone. I remember spending half my Disney vacation on a payphone, uh, talking business and trying to run a deal because that's how you did it. And uh, so the, 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 the best part would be just uh, taking the time to vacation and go places and see things and then having the money to do so, which is also from hard work. So those would be my favorite things in life. Money, family, God, not in that order. Right, very good. Is there anything that I forgot to ask you that uh, maybe you wanted to bring up and, and talk about? Well, I could reverse this interview on you and start asking you questions, but we don't have time for that, so I'm gonna let that go. And I'm sure somebody's gonna interview you, and I wanna be on the other side of that camera when that happens, so <laughs> please make sure that's arranged. Okay, I'll do my best, my friend. Thank you very much for the interview. Today. Thanks, Randy, appreciate right. it.